Good morning, folks. Uh, welcome back to 3 Zen Bobos here. So in a minute, I'm going to get into uh, three ship and four ship, giving appreciation what the train uh, was like for that. But before I do, I think I need to, to have a little bit of a reality check here. When I went through pilot training in 1970-71, we were under a program wherein uh, Air Training Command trained a universally assignable pilot. Now that was different from uh, the Navy's philosophy. The Navy shred guys out after uh, basic flight school where some of them would go on to be fighter pilots, others would go on to be cargo um, tanker bomber pilots, and some a few others would go on to helos. But the Air Force took pride in being in putting out um, universally assignable pilots. The theory is um, anybody that graduated from Air Force undergraduate pilot training could fly just about anything in the Air Force inventory. And I, when I heard that, I just subconsciously filed that in uh, Air Force manual bullshit. There is no way. Um, what we had was a system of merit in those days. Everything was graded. Everything. Link rides, which were simulators in those days, to our academic scores, to our flight scores, our check ride scores. Everything had a grade on it, just clear cut. And at the end of the program, you were given a, we had a block of airplanes that came down. They put them on the, the um, uh, chalkboard and we all gathered in the flight room. They gave uh, the number one guy a piece of chalk and he walked up, took that piece of chalk and lined through the airplane that he wanted. So it's just the way it went. Uh, what we saw was the fighters went first, and then uh, the IP slots went, uh, because if you went to an IP slot, a T-37 or a T-38, there was a good chance you could snag a fighter coming out of those. And then um, C-141s, and uh, then maybe KC-135s and C-130s and uh, C-121s. And then you get down to... Um, the bottom tier was uh, O2s and uh, B-52s and the like. Well, SAC took exception to that. They didn't like the thought of their guys all coming from the bottom of the class. So they started whining and complaining. And About 1974, maybe 73, Air Force uh, bent to it and said, you know what, you got a point here. So we're going to do away with the, um, the uh, order of merit, if you will. And uh, they did away with the, the number order of merit, but there was still a uh, subsurface order of merit. I don't know how the dang thing was scored, but uh, part of it was you had to come out of pilot training with an FAR, a fighter attack reconnaissance recommendation in order to uh, qualify for a fighter attack or reconnaissance. And, and actually, I think if I remember right, you had to have an FAR recommendation to get an IP slot. So they did that, and then they mush mouth through um, uh, the tanker and uh, cargo assignments and so forth. So when it was all said and done with this brand new system, the guys that got FAR uh, recommendations were at the top of the class, and the guys that were the next tier, they got the C-141s and the KC-135s and C-130s and so forth, and the guys at the bottom of the class got the B-52s. That really works slick. But be that as it may, it just it's just the way it was. Okay, that being said, in order to be a universally assignable pilot, we all got to fly four ship. And that was fun. Some might even say it was sporty at times. But be that as it, may, as it is, or as it was, it was fun. Okay, I got back to um, uh, the training command in 1975. And we were still training everybody um, to be a universally assignable pilot. Swell. So we had all kinds of students in our uh, four ship flights, and that made it interesting. And I think the best way to describe the early four ship and three ship flights with with brand new students in in uh, three to the three ship and four ship would be to imagine yourself in orbit at 33,000 feet and you're flying over one of our MOAs, uh, military uh, operating areas, and looking down at one of the areas. 
And as you look down, you see a foreship come in. And when you see this foreship, and they're easy to see, by the way, because they're all painted white, for crying out loud. Anyway, so you see this foreship come in, and we've turned the clock ahead a little bit to where we've introduced uh, Tactical to three ship and four ship. Tactical actually came in to Vance around 1978. So that's what you're looking at. And once they get um, engaged in tactical flying, um, I think it's best described by walking into a Vietnamese restaurant and, and ordering a bowl of soup. And look at that, look hard into that bowl of soup. There's a lot going on in that bowl of soup. And that's kind of what it was like watching brand new kids flying tactical in four ship. That's probably the best way I could describe it. At any rate, four ship is nothing more than taking the, air, um, the two airplanes in two ship and now adding one on the lead's left wing, who becomes two, and adding one on the previous two's right wing, and they become three and four. And the maneuvers that we would practice in um, two ship, now we had elements. Element would be one and two, and then the other one would be three and four, and we began operating uh, like that. And again, teaching just the same things that we taught in two ship, fingertip, uh, root formation where we spread the formation, uh, echelon formation where we do a uh, turn of 90 to 180 degrees where when you turn instead of fingertip we come up on the guy's wing now what you do is you roll in behind him like that and looking at his belly. I remember and I mentioned this in another um, in a prior uh, video but it's still funny. One day we're out there flying and we uh, echelon we didn't call for it. The leader would look over at number two and give him the signal like that, and two would acknowledge, and then he'd just roll, and if he if he went up on the wing, it'd be up on, everybody go to fingertip, but usually just everybody rolled into echelon. Okay, but this one day, he, get, he starts to turn, and two comes up on the wing like this. Well, Howard Nicholas was number three, so he's back here, and he's looking this guy up on the wing, and Howard Nicholas, Nicholas was a Mormon guy, uh, just a great guy. I love flying with Howard. And he had a, a way of correcting errors so subtly. He hit the mic button. He said, Echelon, you hockey puck. <laughs> and we were all, it was, anyway, Echelon, you hockey puck. Uh, two was solo, by the way. So then two gingerly <laughs> starts sliding down. Howard gave him plenty of room to get back in. But Echelon. <laughs> You hockey puck. It's still funny. Anyway, so we do echelon turns, then we do um, lazy eight maneuvers, all to build just basic um, um, formation flying uh, to uh, build, uh, to let them work on stability, to build their self confidence and um, and things like that. Also, very important to teach them, teach the students how to to think ahead. Um, Flying lead was a lot tougher than flying um, two, three, or four because you had to think for four airplanes, and uh, that took uh, quite a bit of concentration. Now I'm going to take a time out here a minute and tell you that 1970-71, um, I dreaded position changes in four ship. I dreaded them um, because we were required in those days. We had the lineup cards, our lineup cards, with uh, everybody's tail number on it. And we took off with us in a certain order. So we knew that. But when it came time for the position change, what we would do is um, the lead would kind of shake everybody out to a root position, uh, spread. And then he would say, uh, Reno 1-7 flight position change. And you hear 2, 3, 4. And then he would go down the laundry list of airplanes. Airplane 8813 becomes lead, 8814 becomes 2, 8815 becomes 3, and whatever his error, 8102 becomes 4, acknowledge. And then everybody had to call back and acknowledge their tail number with their new position. Oh, Jesus. So that could take, you know, that took a little bit of time and a little bit of thinking. And then when number four acknowledged his new position as number three, 
the formation was considered complete, and it was in, it was now number uh, Leeds um, airplane, which is now the new number four. It was up to him to get back into position. So he slid back into position, and uh, then the formation um, uh, change uh, was complete. The problem with that is it took about uh, 20 miles, 15 miles to do that. And so if you weren't paying attention, you could easily bust your area on that maneuver. So what we would try to do is go diagonally across the areas to, when we were doing that. And still, if anybody was dragging their feet, you ended up having to do a echelon turn to get back into the area. And I dreaded those. At any rate, uh, we would take... Uh, We'll come back now to 1978. Uh, we would take students, uh, whether they were graduating number one in the class or number last in the class, we'd take them on four ship and just give them um, uh, an introduction to fundamentals of four ship. They were nowhere near prof as proficient as they would become once they got to their respective airplanes. But at least they had an introduction into how to take four airplanes and drill them through the sky with some semblance of order. And those rides were fun to fly in actuality, especially when you were flying with the um, the guys at the higher higher part of the class. I mean, we just went out and just had had a ball with those guys. So that kind of ties up three ship and four ship. Oh, three ship, take one airplane and uh, leave him on the ramp, or send he goes home for a mechanic or whatever, and you just pick up and fly the same maneuvers as you do in in four ship. So. That was about it. Um, today, they I don't have a clue what they do today. Um, I just don't have a clue, so I'm not going to even comment on it. At any rate, good to see everybody here today. Uh, I'm going to next tell you about a couple of incidents that happened at Vance. Uh, I was part of one, and I heard about the other one. So, hang loose. Bubble, base gear, stop.